Uh, here's one from this morning. Uh, open up the computer. Right? But this guy commented, and you can get two free Southwest tickets. Anybody see that this morning? Yeah? Did you get your tickets? No. <laughs> What's the Southwest line? Take me away. Yeah. So you get your two free tickets. And so, I mean, that's a little bit interesting. Let's see. Free, fly free southwest.tumblr. You click on there, it takes you to the site. It's a redirect from Tumblr, but then it takes you to a site that was like free, fly free southwest.info. And what they want you to do is simply type I heart southwest and you'll get two free tickets. And if you notice, there have been 10,000 people that have already done this. So we actually kept clicking, there's a lot of redirects, about 60 different URLs that it went to, and it basically got you with a lot of surveys as for your cell phone number and all of these things, and uh, there's some monetization through surveys, it's actually your, your cell phone, so some uh, paid text messages, uh, tricks in there as well. Uh, but this is the type of thing that's happening every day, kind of leveraging more and more of the legitimate brands uh, and using Facebook to spread viral. Uh, Twitter. Uh, some of you admit to using Twitter, some of you would not admit to use Twitter. So here's what's going on there. So here's an example. Twitter has this thing called trending topics, right? And it talks whatever people are talking about that day. So in this particular day, people are talking about Follow Friday and Pirate Day and TGIF. So what you see here are three different accounts talking about three different trending topics pointing to three different URLs. The thing that they all had in common is they all redirected you to this lovely server in China that served as a traffic distribution system for rogue antivirus. So the next thing you know, you again have this lovely decoration on your desktop. So you're out there trying to find out about Pirate Day, the next thing you know, you're infected. So what we're seeing is that the attackers are out there making all these fake accounts, making all these fake accounts on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is claiming to have like 130 million users on the network. And so we've been spending some time looking at, well, how many of those users are real? How many are legitimate? So we built this thing that we call the Twitter <coughs> Reputation System. And we mine different Twitter accounts. We have access to probably 30, 40 million Twitter accounts we've analyzed over the years. Uh, so what we end up looking at is who are you following, who's following you, how much do you tweet, and different things. So one of the interesting things that we've seen is, if you look back from the beginning of time at Twitter, 2006, this tracks the growth rate of Twitter over time. And this actually zooms in to this one period from November 08 to April 09, six month period that I call the red carpet era. Because what happened, if you look at the top 100 people on Twitter today, half of them joined Twitter in the same six month period. So it's like all the famous people move into the neighborhood at the same time. All right, so no matter what you're into culturally, whether it be Kim Kardashian, or Ashton Kutcher, or Oprah Winfrey, or P. Diddy, or Fifty Cent, or whatever you're into culturally, half the celebrities join Twitter in the same six month period. Right, and so what happened is their fan base came. So during that six month period, the user growth rate of Twitter went from two percent to twenty percent. And so what do we know security? Wherever the users are, the attackers come. And so what we want to do is measure like how much crime was happening once the neighborhood became more populated. So this looks at the crime rate of Twitter over the years. Since 2006, there's this crime rate of 1%. Meaning 1% of the accounts were created any given month and kicked out. Uh, as it went over time, it went from 1% to 2%, then this red corporate area went from 2% to 3%. Four months after that, it went from 3% to 12%. 12% means one in every eight accounts created were kicked off from malicious activity. One in every eight accounts. So you hear about how big Twitter is and how valuable Twitter is and how many users are there. But if you look at the point of time, one in every eight accounts that were created were kicked off from malicious activity. Right, that shows you how fast the attackers are able to react. When the users came over, the attackers were right there behind them. Uh, here's, a, here's a tool that we created. It's a free tool. It's called Profile Protector. Uh, you go to profileprotector.com. It's a free tool. You just log in, and it'll actually scan your Facebook and scan your Twitter and look for malicious users and look for malicious links and let you know about them. So it's just something to kind of be aware of and take a look at. So the last thing I'll mention here: uh, web exploitation. So I get this question all the time. Oh, I've seen all these different sites that are being attacked. You know, who has time to go attack Curious George? So, Curious George, who has the time to go attack some little furniture store in south of France? Who has the time to go attack all these little mom and pop stores? So, what's happening? Why do we see so many attacks nowadays? Uh, so, web exploit kits. Anybody familiar with web exploit kits? Yeah, a couple guys. So, it's interesting. So, what happened is basically a very small set of people that are talented have taken their skill set and packaged it up and kind of made it a point and click thing to attack websites. Very much like you know, software companies here have packaged up software and we made a point and click and we're offering that software to you. 
and we have trade shows, and we have, and they do the same thing, they compete. And there's about 12 different, 20 different people that compete. They say, oh, buy my web exploit kit. Don't buy my web exploit kit. If you buy my web exploit kit, you'll be successful. If you buy my web exploit kit, you'll be profitable. And they compete on what customer service is better. Right? My GUI is better. Right? They do the same thing that the normal legitimate software industry does. I don't know that they hold conferences in the data, but you know, they do similar things that we do as legitimate software companies. So, so here's a view. Here's a, a actual login screen from one of the web exploit kits. So it shows you their mindset. It shows you how they advertise. This thing is basically saying, if you use my web exploit kit, you will be successful like I am. You'll have shiny suits. <laughs> Right? You'll have a driveway that goes directly into the ocean. <laughs> right? And your women will have wings. <laughs> My favorite is you will literally have trees with money growing on them. Right? Right? So this is actually the login screen for one of the web exploit kits, but it shows you how they advertise. It's all about use this thing to make money. I make it easy for you to hack websites. When you log into this thing, you see a dashboard. Right? So you have web-based administration, you have graphical dashboard, some of the same things that companies over here were just talking about. Right? But here you see, this is someone never wrote a line of code, but all of a sudden, you've attacked 13,000 websites, 11 of those, 100 of those have been successful. Right? Those sites are in, and those websites are in 20 different countries, they're running multiple operating systems, multiple web browsers. It shows why we see the scale and why of attack that we see nowadays, because someone that just spent $1,000, can start to do this and cause damages. So one piece of good news here is because there's so many attacks with so few web exploit kits, there's just a many to one relationship that many different attack, attack sites were compromised by the same exploit kit. So what we did is actually build signatures for different web exploit kits. And so now when someone's visiting a website and it looks suspicious, I can look to see if a web exploit kit is installed on that site or not. Because each of these kits has different signatures and signs and symptoms that we can identify. They put the administration screen in a certain place, and either set up files in a certain place. So we spent time studying these exploit kits so that we can determine if a user is visiting a site and it looks suspicious, we can tell if an exploit kit is installed or not. So, you know, what we, what we looked at so far is, and we started off, remember, with sound volume down the path. And my whole premise was that it went down a half because the attackers are finding more efficient and effective ways to, to monetize their skill set. Right? And it's funny, these are the same guys that over the years, these same guys that were doing denial of service attacks. Remember when they were doing denial of service attacks? They would do a big denial of service on a website, and they would pick up the phone and they would call you. Say, hey, I have your website taken down. You robbed me $50,000, I'll leave you alone. Right? That, that, that doesn't scale so much. All these guys are getting arrested. Right, it wasn't a very good anonymous way to monetize their skill set. And then these same guys start to try to send spam, right? They would send you emails and say, hey, I have fake Rolex watches. I have this amazing pill that would improve your weakness. Right? They have all these, these things that they were offering for sale, and now they're just saying, oh, you're infected. You have rogue antivirus. You should give me $30 and I'll disinfect you. Right? So they've been trying to monetize their skill set over the years. So this is interesting. We'll take a look back. Anybody remember, you go back to 2002, 2003, and I'm going to wrap up here, and look at when spam was just off the charts, and everybody was random about it, there were these two guys that were kind of the leaders of spammers. Right? There was a guy named Alan Rowski, he called himself the godfather of spam. Right? And there was another guy named Scott Richter, he called himself the king of spam. Right? And Alan Rowski would always be the number one person on the top spammers list. But Scott Richter would be number two, and he would also be number nine, because he had two different companies that were saying spam. And right, they had their claims to fame. Like Alan Rowski was known for in one summer he made three million dollars profit on just pump and dump Chinese stocks. Right? This guy Scott Richter he used to brag about remember those Iraq most wanted cards? Remember those when they were you know, yeah? So he used to brag about he could send spam so well and he was so effective at getting his message out there that he sold forty thousand decks of cards before he ever printed them. Right? So these guys were making a lot of money, and then all of a sudden they started to have problems. FBI raided this guy's house in 2005. This guy was sued by New York in 2003. They started to have some problems. So my point is, let's take a look at what these guys got us with the most notorious spammers. Uh, what are they up to nowadays? What are they up to nowadays? So, our friend Alan Rowski is in the middle of serving a four-year sentence in a federal prison. Right, so he's kind of like that way. Yeah. Our friend Scott Richter actually just founded a social gaming company. <laughs> 
right? So you guys kind of who are behind these things, right? We go from spam to web to social-based attacks and gaming-based attacks. Who are behind these things? My point is it's the same individuals that we've been dealing with, organized primaries that we've been dealing with for decades, that are looking at different ways to monetize their skill set and get money from your pocket and into their pocket. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up. I mentioned earlier kind of this, where we spend our time doing, really analyzing all the threats that show up, figuring out how to turn that back into useful security intelligence, and it, it fuels the products that, that we make at Barracuda, whether you're talking about protecting the users with like web filtering-based products, protecting the users that they're surfing the web, or you're talking about protecting your websites. So we have web application firewall products that protect your websites and make that. Uh, so with that, I'll wrap up. Thanks for coming and spending some time with me today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.